Hey guys, welcome to Grace Bible Church. Um, if you want to stand with us when we start our service. One, two, your love is amazing. amazing. He is unchanging. Your love is unbounded beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery. How you gently lift me when I am surrounded. Your love carries me. Hallelujah. Good morning. I uh, just want to say, if you're visiting today, we want to welcome you to Grace Bible Church. Um, there's more information in our newsletter we send out every week. If you're not on the email and would like to be, you could stop back at the table in the back after service and get signed up. Um, again, if you're new here, also on the sign-up sheet, uh, Julie, our church administrator, has kind of gone through the sign-up sheet, so you fill it out with your name and information and stuff. She also added a bunch of different categories down there that if you would like to be involved in different areas, there's a plenty of different areas there that, you know, to choose from. So it's kind of been an updated sheet. So um, our Quench, Lifeline, and Level Up Youth Group will meet today after service. Um, next Sunday, we will all have our Christmas photos taken again. Terry will be back. She'll be set up in the back of the church back there. So it's not only a Christmas photos, but it's also to update our church uh, directory. So if you haven't signed up and would like to, you can get a hold of Terry or just when you show up, go back there and Terry will squeeze you in. We'll be doing it before service between 9.15 and 10.15, and then after service until 12.30, and if it runs longer, Terry will stick around and take care of things. So, um, also, next Sunday, we're gonna start with the uh, children's, the uh, pre-K, K, and first through fifth grade. We're gonna start practicing uh, their youth program, their songs. So when service starts, uh, we'll take the kids, instead of back to the normal area, we're gonna take them upstairs. Uh, the plumbers are going to work with them for the next three or four weeks on practicing some songs. But then on the 13th of December, we will have our children's program 
So they will come up, sing their songs and stuff like that. So if you have young kids and they want to partake, try to have them here the next few weeks so that they can learn the songs. And again, it's only two or three songs. I'm not sure how many. And they're not complicated songs, anything like that. It's stuff the kids already know. So uh, it'll be a good time for them. So uh, birthdays this week. Christine Hendrickson on the 16th. Rebecca Plummer on the 19th. And Stella Lim on the 21st. We have no anniversaries this week. So um, when we do communion a little bit later, we ask that the workers would go through first so that they can take communion and get back to the children's ministry and get ready. Um, so other than that, our elder board for the last three years, I think, uh, pretty much has been, Rick and I are the two elders right now. Russ Jansen is an associate elder and pastor has, has just been part of the leadership team. So we've been discussing it for quite a while and pastor is going to rejoin the elder board. So he will also be an elder. But we also have asked Jason Plummer. Uh, where's Jason? There's Jason. We've talked to him, and we're going to do a two-week vetting time to see if Jason, he's, he's said he would like to be on the elder board. So over the next two weeks, we asked the congregation, if you have any reason for Jason not to be on the elder board to come forward, if obviously we don't hear anything, Jason will be on the elder board. So that's that. Other than that, Denny, I'm going to turn it over to you. They wouldn't mind hearing if you have reasons that you would like Jason on the uh, board either. They're a positive bunch. Thank you. Okay, I, my first order of business here is to get to, to do something that uh, we used to do an awful lot back in the uh, early days of the Omaha Christian Action Council when we were just getting started uh, with our pro-life ministry. This would have been in the early 80s. And that is to invite up Chris Schlesinger. Chris and I used to do a lot of speaking together. Uh, I was an old hand. She was a young kid just out of school. In fact, she might have she cut classes even to be part of these things. But Chris is going to talk first about a couple of, uh, of ministries going on. The first she's going to talk about is a Sure Women's Center. And so first of all, we just want a general overview. A lot of you guys know about the Crisis Pregnancy Center that Chris has been involved in since its inception. Uh, my goodness, 30 some years ago, 34 years ago. So we're going to start off with a general overview of what the uh, Assure is, what they're doing. This thing on. Oh, and a mic. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I turned it off. Thanks, Denny. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, Denny said, doing this for years. People used to come up to me all the time and say, it's so nice to see young people. I, they don't say that to me anymore. Um, <laughs> I can't imagine why. Um, a sure Pregnancy, or a sure Women's Center started off as AAA Crisis Pregnancy Center, actually under the direction of Denny and Claire Hartford. And um, so Denny and Claire were there from the beginning. They allowed myself and another... Um, actually two of us, Barb Malik and Winnie Kuypis. Barb is still a part of the uh, center as well. We changed our name back in 2013 just to be more relevant to the uh, culture. Women facing unplanned pregnancies don't necessarily see themselves in, in crisis. They just, um, millennials, Gen Zs, they're just saying, I need some um, data. You know, we're, these young women have grown up in the information age. They're used to going online, finding out what they, what they want to finding out what they need to know and making up their own minds. So um, we have been doing this for 34 years. Uh, back in the early 2000s, we began to see our numbers go down. Um, we were still very busy with women coming to us needing help with diapers and parenting classes, which is great and those we do want to uh, help them. But if you were considering abortion or if you thought abortion was your only option, there was no place um, for them to go except the abortion clinic or Planned Parenthood. 
And we just were not, we, we were not relevant. We had become known as that place of really nice people that you go to and they can help you with cribs and, and great, all, all, all those nice things. So we actually heard of a, of a different patient process and we took the uh, training just to give you a little idea of how successful that was. In 2006, we had 39 women make a life choice. Um, and most of those would have made a life choice anyway, again, because of what our, what our brand was. Um, the first year, uh, on January 1st, 2007, we transitioned to this patient process. The first year we had just under 300 women make a life choice and it was moving. Our marketing and everything was moving toward, we were seeing more and more women who felt um, that um, abortion at least was um, um, an option. Um, last year, uh, we had, um, and our years go from July 1st through June 30th. So our last fiscal year, we had over 1,500 women make a life choice. So it's been a, just an amazing growth. Thanks. Um, <laughs> um, now our numbers are down a little bit, actually, because we had over 1,600 the year before, but understand COVID hit. And those numbers can actually be a little, you know, you think, oh, your numbers are down, people aren't coming. And actually what it was is we had to really, um, again, because of COVID, we had, we had to, uh, we never had to close, thank you God, um, but we did have to cut back some hours, cut back because we, you know, we had staff down, we had volu volunteers gone, and so we had to actually change our uh, scheduling line script. Where's Chelsea? There's Chelsea. Chelsea is also on staff um, with us. She does the uh, scheduling line, and we began to be um, asked a very... Um, specific screening questions because if they were planning to carry, if they were seeing um, a doctor, we just said, you know, we're keeping our numbers down. So of those 1,500, over 1,500, these are very high-risk women. And we have um, certain um, life sit situations that we have recognized that make them more at, at risk. So we were going, we were seeing only those really, really high risk. So on the back table, and actually on your cha tables and chairs and stuff, we have our impact re report and gives a lot of data um, in there, so you see we had 1,527 life choices, 84% chose life, which is really good, but we used to have over 90%, but we used to have most of our patients were not at, at high risk. So of those, um, of those 2,135 patients that, that came in, 97% were at risk. And of those 97%, 60% were at a very high risk, meaning they were thinking about it, uh, planning on it, or is so many risk factors, so much, so much pressure. So actually, if you look at that 80, 84%, we're really, really pleased. Now, are we trying to reach them all? Ab absolutely, we're always looking um, to do more. At Assure, um, we'd like to talk about within this, within our uh, center, excuse me, um, we have two different types of those who serve our women. We have Samaritans, those are the ones for the girls who comes in for the uh, pregnancy test. They're looking for data. They're not looking for counsel, just we have a one hour um, appointment with her, including an uh, ultrasound. And um, those, are, those are the uh, Samaritans. They're going to rescue. They're gonna bind up her most immediate need and that is giving her truth. Truth is the most powerful weapon and it belongs to God and we get to be truth, truth tellers. Now once they make that life choice, we'd send them to the innkeepers. And those are our parenting classes, Bible studies, discipleship, mentoring. I could do 45 minutes on, on that alone because these are the women who are wanting more. And it's really, really sweet. And we have a baby store. They earn points and vouchers for coming and they're able um, to turn those in. And another aspect, so that's within the uh, pregnancy center. Another aspect that we have is our um, relationship, healthy, healthy um, relationships. And actually, um, is Allie here? <laughs> She's hiding behind the uh, pillar here, but Allie's actually on our um, healthy relationships uh, staff, and she was hired back in January to be a school speaker, and then what happened in February? <laughs> Schools closed, and we, we didn't know when we hired um, uh, Allie, she had a very, um, as a very specific, a very excellent skill set of knowing how to we manage websites and social, social media, which she does for our church as well, but she was able to step in and we're actually reaching more students now, not being in the uh, schools than we were without. They are, their, their team develops weekly videos, they do podcasts, and in one week, like two weeks ago, we had over 14,000 hits. So we had 14,000 people, am I, am I using the right terms? 14,000 people actually saw the uh, video 
and um, and so that's just taking off. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of good going on, and then lastly, um, as part of the um, uh, what goes on at um, Assure, we're very much aware. Barna research shows tells us that um, really abortion doesn't look any different inside the church versus outside. Um, depending on what study you read, they say one in three, or even uh, or one in four women sitting in any church on any given Sunday is a post-aborted woman. So I'm very much aware that I'm talking to some of you. And please know, we do have a post-abortion Bible study that is led by women who have had that in their, in their uh, past and have received that forgiveness and move forward living in the joy of that. So if there's anybody struggling with that, or you know somebody who is, please let us know, or let, let them know that we are um, available to them as well. The success rate has been so amazing with Assure that they have become a magnet for crisis pregnancy centers around the country. Could you tell us a little bit about the training ministry? Yeah, we, um, our board saw the success that we had going from 39 to you know, over 1,600 lives saved, um, and they became very passionate about training other centers in this. So to date, we have trained about 40 pregnancy centers across the uh, country. Um, all over, north, south, east, west. Um, centers come to Omaha and stay for a week and we train them in the uh, process. And what we're preparing for is our first international training. Um, Ireland just legalized abortion about 18 months ago. And we're working with a center there, stupid COVID, otherwise I'd be going to Ireland. But anyway, I'm not bitter. But we're gonna be doing um, um, an online training for that. So actually, and we're really ho and we're really excited because they're in touch with pregnancy centers in England and just all around that area that might just stretch it in. So we're excited. Now there's information on the back tables. If you want to find out more about Assure, if you'd like to get involved with them, even if you'd like to get their prayer emails or something, please mm -hmm. talk to Chelsea, Allie, or Chris afterwards. But before Chris leaves, we also want to ask her about another program uh, of the church that she's involved in. Could you? Yeah. On the back table, when you walked in, you probably saw there were the two little uh, Christmas trees. Um, what our center does every year for our patients who need it, and excuse me, clients that need it, they're the ones who go through the parenting class. We do have relationship with these, with these families. So we are invested in them. They're invested with us. And if they need help um, with uh, Christmas, so we adopt a family and our church has very graciously for years um, actually uh, um, Assure has done it for like 19 years and I think our church has done it every year since we've been open um, so we've been very very um, um, blessed that we've been able to always meet the needs of all of our uh, patients this year it's a little bit different because of COVID we don't have as many people able to um, adopt and yet the needs are up um, so the family that we have adopted um, she's a single mom um, has four children and I happened to be in the office when she came in and filled out the uh, form and under under her name she just gonna we, we say puts name and then what you want and she was putting down toilet paper cleaning items canned goods these can we said no 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 what do you need so on there on the Christmas trees back there you what we would have you do is select one of those and if all of those are gone and you still want to give that's what we would you know, ask you to do by the uh, non-perishable items, the canned goods, the toilet paper, those, those kinds of things. But everything back there are um, gifts that the family specifically asked for. Okay, I'm gonna try to explain this because we, we, we tend to have to, like a um, little bit of difficulty following this. So these are, these are on the uh, tree. And on the inside it'll say to whoever it is, the family member, and on the other side it says who she is. So like this is Jasmine, she's a 10 year old girl. And then what she's asked for, she's asked for shoes size three. So once you do that, we ask that you wrap all the presents for children. Adults you can put into a gift bag, but we want children to be able to unwrap. So please, if you could wrap the uh, children's gifts and then put this exact tag on it. And then I get it back and then I can check it off to make sure that Jasmine got everything. Um, if you wanna buy more, that's, that's fine. But make sure that you attach this, then I check it off and then I cut off what it actually is. Then Jasmine gets her gift and she's still surprised on, on uh, Christmas. Um, also, if you take a tag or when you take a tag, there is a sheet of paper that 
gives you all the um, uh, directions and, and those kinds of things, as well as um, contact, so if you have any, any uh, questions. And we are asking that these be back by December 6th. I know that sounds really early, but we have to get them in, get them organized, and then call the uh, families so the families can come and get them um, before uh, uh, Christmas. So um, if you have any questions, again, Chelsea, Allie, or I um, can help you with that. Becky Moore is, where's Becky? There she is, way over there. Becky is going to be helping with this as well. So um, you can ask her questions as well. So I think that's it. Great, great. Thank you. Can we have a, a little applause for these ministries? This is something else. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, my. Thank you. What a delight. How exciting that people are doing stuff for the kingdom of God in our fellowship. Uh, last Tuesday at our Hartford Cafe, we celebrated the Marines' birthday. How many Marines are in here this morning? I don't see any. Well, that's okay. Every, they, they serve cake to all services, they told us. Uh, and then the next day, of course, we had Veterans Day. Now, what, what is the significance of these two? It shows that our culture honors history. History remains, despite the efforts of the cancel culture, it remains quite important to us. Well, this morning we are going to partake as a church of a celebration of another historical event. In fact, it could well be argued it is the event of history, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He who was the spotless Lamb of God who died to take away the sins of the world. Now here at Grace Bible Church, we do this in kind of two waves. Uh, what we do, historically we had done this with a breakfast, but nowadays what we do is we take the bread together, the little cracker, and that is to symbolize Jesus' broken body. A body that was broken again, not by the Romans alone, not by the Jewish leaders alone, but by God the Father who sent his son for the express purpose of being broken and bleeding and dying to pay the penalty of our sins. So we're gonna ask you, as Dave mentioned, for the uh, kids workers to go through first, then the elders will direct the rest of us to go through and get the cracker, and let's have a word of prayer before we do, before we celebrate together in this wonderful historical remembrance. Jesus, we honor you for your sacrifice in our behalf, thank you. Thank you for your love, for your holiness. Thank you for your obedience throughout your entire life here on earth, which made you the spotless Lamb of God. It made it so that when God the Father looked at you, you were spotless and you deserved resurrection. No one else on the planet has ever lived a sinless life, but you did. And yet you gave your life for us. You became sin in our behalf. Lord Jesus, we thank you for that. And now as we take this cracker, it's just a symbol, but what it symbolizes is so profound, it's so significant. Lord, let us remember in such a way that it changes our behavior in the course of our week. We ask this in your name, amen. Thank you, Allie. Uh, I was reminded, uh, Chris mentioned that um, three years ago, Sandra's husband and Allie's dad uh, passed away, and he was a Marine. So we're grateful for his surface, uh, Semper Fidelis. Uh, before we get into this morning's sermon, I had asked uh, Dave Schellenberg earlier if he would lead us in prayer uh, for the ministry of Assure. And... Um, so Dave, if you could, uh, Dave's got control of the mic back there so we can just listen to him. It's not the voice of God. Something right next to it, and that's Dave Schellenberg. Dave, thank you. I suppose I could do something like this and make it even more. No, we won't do that. You know, I've known Denny for a long, long time, uh, back from the early days of the... Uh, Omaha Christian Action Council, and I knew that Chris was, you know, one of their speakers and everything, but uh, I didn't really know who she was, and then all of a sudden, she and Dave showed up at our church, and I go, oh, so this is the Chris Schlesinger that I always read about in the newsletters and everything, so um, 
and I do feel very honored that you asked me to pray for them for that ministry and, and for our uh, church's part in doing that. So, Father, it is incredible that we can come before the throne of the creator of the universe, such a vast, huge expanse from our perspective, and yet it's just, it's minuscule c compared to you and who you are. And we think of ourselves as being so small in comparison to the universe, and yet you did create us uh, really as the, the most important part of that, in that you created us in your image, and you gave us that uh, ability to have a relationship with you, and we are unlike uh, the rest of creation because of that. And Lord, it's, uh, as you know, it's because we are created in your image that we value life so much and why we want to do everything we can to protect that life. And uh, Lord, as that has become such a big issue, not only in our country, but uh, in other parts of the world too, as, as Chris was just uh, talking about. Um, Lord, I know that it's something that is very close to your heart uh, because you created us to be in relationship with you. So the work that uh, Chris and Chelsea and Allie and the others are doing is an important part of maintaining that relationship between your creation and you, the creator. And we as a church are really privileged to take part in that too as we help out in the way we can and, and uh, particularly in even just praying for the work that is being done there. That you are touching lives and that's what, that's what you really want to do. Um, so again, we just come before you with praise and for your glory ask you to especially put your protection over Assure and the people that work there and that you will continue to bless them and that you will continue to enable us uh, to have a part in that ministry as well. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Dave. You know, like I said earlier, it is so exciting to be a part of a uh, church fellowship where people are involved in ministry, uh, not only uh, with the uh, CPC, as we've uh, spoken about this morning. I was talking to Rob Golden last night about the new Grace Garage ministry that's going on uh, to help people with um, their cars and maybe some other uh, fix-it jobs. Just yesterday, he was able to help one of the sisters in our church get the heater in her car fixed. So now she'll be able to drive to work and back this winter uh, without uh, complications or discomfort and also helping a fellow a widower from another church. So that's a terrific thing. Yesterday we had a Wind in the Willows brunch uh, at our house that was attended in part by people from Grace Bible Church. Uh, then yesterday afternoon we were at the uh, Davis family pancake party. Uh, you know, the Davis family have such an incredible mission to missionaries. And I know a number of Grace Bible Church people were there to help them out uh, yesterday in their project for missions. We also have the seams for a cause. We've got this new moms group that's getting started. Uh, we've got Russ Jansen down at the Open Door Mission. We've got a number of guys from the mission who are involved in a very intensive discipleship training course. And so we're really honored that they've come along to uh, join us at church. Uh, Douglas over here, Douglas Talks, the JJ and Laura, this puppet ministry that I can tell you from the fall of Palooza is an outstanding ministry. And they have got videos on YouTube that are going around the world. So when we think of Assure doing training internationally, we've already got one voice from Grace Bible Church that is reaching kids all around the world. Just incredible stuff. And a lot of you are ministering on the job or at the gym or in your school. 
Uh, some of you are homemakers on the home front. You're honoring God with the works of your hand, with the attitude of your heart. Many of you dealing with the ministry of being parents and grandparents. Good on you for all of you who are doing this in the spirit of the Lord. Way to go. I say that in part because we're going to talk about discipleship this morning. The text that I've chosen is in Luke 5. It's a great discipleship text, and it's a very interesting miracle. I've got to tell you, a lot of preachers don't cover this miracle. It doesn't seem to be as flashy as some others, but I think it's particularly significant even for our day. So if you would, in your Bibles, turn to Luke 5. We're going to read through the first 11 verses of that text. I'm reading in the New American Standard. Yours might be a little bit different. Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him, speaking of Jesus, and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, that is the Sea of Galilee. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And Jesus got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and lay down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all of his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. So also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear, from now on you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Let's unpack this text just a little bit. Now it came about while the multitude were pressing around Jesus and listening to the word of God. This event happens very early in Jesus' public ministry. Nevertheless, he is becoming famous. Well, famous to some, more infamous to others. For instance, most of the, the common people who either hear Jesus or even hear about him like very much what they hear. After all, Jesus speaks with astounding wisdom and grace and compassion, yet with tremendous authority. He's unlike anything they've ever heard. Do you remember later on in Jesus' ministry, the religious officials send the temple guard to arrest Jesus? They're going to kill him. And they send the temple guard, and the temple go to get Jesus, and they return empty-handed. This is at the peril of their life. They have refused their orders. And when they come back and the officials say, where is he? Why didn't you bring him in? Do you remember their answer? Never a man spoke like this man. Jesus was unique. He taught so differently than the religious rulers of Israel. In fact, he often contradicted them. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes and lawyers, they had laid down a very formal, external, extremely legalistic approach to religion. It was full of man-made rules, petty rules, rules that puffed them up in their own pride rather than glorifying God. Jesus' teaching openly derides this false religion. He shows it to be contrary to what the law and the prophets actually taught. Whereas Jesus, his message is in full harmony with the Old Testament revelation. So he calls out the religious rulers for their self-righteousness. 
for their sinful manipulation of the people, indeed, for their exploitation of the people. But Jesus' message, completely different. He speaks of a tender-hearted relationship that one can have with a merciful God, a holy God, totally other than us, but yet approachable through grace. Jesus himself is humble. He's gracious. He meets with all kinds of people, including the poor and women and the handicapped and Samaritans and Gentiles and little kids, the kind of people that the Pharisees wouldn't be caught dead hanging around. He even explains that those who would come to God must do so with the faith of a little child. So yes, Jesus' message and his method is something that is fresh, it's brilliant, and it's very attractive. And of course, Jesus' message is being accompanied by miracles, bona fide miracles. The lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life. These aren't parlor tricks. This isn't stage magic. This is the miracle working power of an awesome, sovereign God. The Jews of the first century had only heard of these kind of miracles. But they were all from ancient Israel. This was occurring in their midst. And in many cases, they saw the miracle happen before their eyes. So it's no wonder the crowds are flocking to Jesus. They're coming in droves. The houses and the synagogues can't contain the number of people who want to hear from Jesus. And they're full of interest and curiosity and hope. Is Jesus the long-awaited Messiah? Some believe he is. Others hope he is. Some think Jesus is a prophet in the style of Moses or Elijah or Samuel. There are some who held to a form of reincarnation that actually was quite popular in the, among the Jews of Jesus' day. So in their case, they thought maybe he is the real Elijah, come back to life. So they come to hear and to see. But there are baser motives in the hearts of some of those crowd members. These are the skeptics, the flatterers, the people who are merely looking for entertainment or a handout, the hangers-on. And then there are the pompous religious leaders themselves who are envious of his popularity and his power they're afraid of his power and his popularity, and ultimately they will try to destroy him. So they're looking to trip him up, to embarrass him, to find some chink in his armor, to lay some trap that he might fall into. So there are all sorts of reasons for people to be crowding close to Jesus to hear what he has to say. Let's break this down a bit. In this particular case, in verse 1, we see that the number of people who want to hear Jesus, they're so pressing against him. The Greek is really quite clear. They're actually pushing him towards the shoreline. If Jesus isn't careful, he's going to be in the water soon. So that's why he turns to Simon and he says, I'd like to have your boat. I want you to notice he asks Simon. He doesn't order it. He sees these two fishing boats at the shoreline. Almost certainly they were deckless craft, uh, big enough for four or five member crew. That was the usual craft that was used there. The Sea of Galilee, it's not really a sea, it's a big lake. It's about 16 miles long, six miles at its broadest point. But there was a very lucrative fishing trade done there. We're going to find out that these guys were really quite successful fishermen. But at this moment, the boats are empty. The fishermen are busy trying to mend and clean the nets so that they will be ready to go out for the night's fishing. Now keep in mind too, these nets are big and cleaning them was a laborious job. You didn't just get the hose out and squirt them off. You had to manually pick out all the seaweed, all the stuff. 
we're going to see also that they had a hard night the night before. So these, part, these boats are part of one business. Two brothers, two sets of brothers. Peter and Andrew and James and John. These four guys are in partnership together in this successful fishing business. Now I want you to notice something. Your Bible might very well say the calling of the first disciples as it introduces this text. The fact is John 1, 35 refers to these guys already as Jesus' disciples. So what's going on? Well, the fact is they were disciples of John the baptizer. And so when they heard John the baptizer say of Jesus, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, they understood John the Baptist was the forerunner, but he was giving way now to Jesus. And so they are referred to as disciples of Jesus, but they were only disciples in a general sense. This calling here, Jesus is going to ask them to be, in effect, professionals, full-time disciples, full-time missionaries. The word used of these men, by the way, is an old Greek word that goes all the way back to Homer. Literally, it's translated fisher folk. They were fisher folk. It suggests an entire way of life. It wasn't something that they just did from eight to five. Everything about their life was fishing. And as I said, they were very successful in this case. But right now, they're not serving Jesus as full-time ministry. In fact, you can see this by the fact that they were not with Jesus when he's addressing this crowd. They weren't with him the night before. They were out fishing. And now as he's preaching to the crowd, they're not there helping him. They're on the shoreline. They're tending to their nets, getting ready to go fish that night. Verse 3. So he says, yes, these guys are still on the clock as fishermen, but they're hoping to get a good night or a day's rest before they have to go to work. And Jesus comes in and he asks Simon, can I have your boat? Would you put out a little way so I can continue to preach? This is going to give Jesus some relief, not only from this pressing crowd, in this case, literally pressing crowd. Have you ever been in a crowd where you almost fear for your safety because it's being pressed so far? Go to the Orient or Eastern Europe for that experience. It can be kind of hairy. So that's what's happening. So Jesus is now in this boat, and he's also going to be able to teach with more effectiveness. Probably they've gone into a little inlet where he's got a bit of a horseshoe thing going on, so people are able to hear from three sides. He's able to address them more effectively. The text tells us that Jesus sat down to preach some more. This is very common to a Jewish rabbi of the era. The Greek tense of the word also suggests that he continues preaching from the same theme that he had been. So this is like just the next chapter of the same message that he'd been preaching on shore. So this first section of the chapter ends with this public address ending. Verse 4, when Jesus had finished speaking, he asked Simon, again he asks him, he doesn't order it, to take the boat out into deep water to let down the nets for a catch. This is in the daytime. This is after they've already ascertained there are no fish running today. So it implies that the nets have already been claimed, they're they're ready to go fishing again, but this is when the guys have been looking forward to some rest and recreation. Now they gotta go to work again, and and work doesn't look like it's gonna be very successful. Verse five, let me read it. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. Do you think there might be a little bit of petulance in Simon's mind? A little disgruntlement, at least a little second guessing? After all, fishing is Simon's thing. It's what he does. He's good at it. And his experience from the night before suggests there's no fish here, Lord, and certainly not in the day. And the Greek word that, where it says they worked hard, it's a word that's often used for suffering. They had really been put to it the night before. And now Jesus is asking something from them 
that I, I think if we just have a cursory re- reading of the text, we don't appreciate. So I can imagine Simon, at least maybe if I were Simon, thinking, Jesus, could you please remember that you are a carpenter? I'm the fisherman. And I would never come to you and suggest a way to make a better shelf or table or chair. So maybe you shouldn't be so quick to give me advice about fishing. But no matter what Simon might have been thinking, here's what he says, and here's what he did. Okay, master, upon your word, I will lay down my nets. It makes no sense to me. It looks like a real stretch and it's going to be hard and I'm tired, but upon your word, I'll do what you say. That alone is a sermon. Upon your word, I will do as you ask. What happens? Verse 6 and 7. Success beyond their imagination. An unexpected catch of the like they had never known. In fact, It was so astounding that they realize it is another miracle. The dead haven't been raised. A blind man doesn't see, but Simon gets it. It's a miracle. There's been divine intervention. There's been a suspension of natural law. And so we see Simon Peter. He deals with the contrast, not only of his former petulance or unbelief or skepticism and the authority of Jesus. But it's a contrast he then links with his own sinfulness because he understands miracles are from God. They're not man-centered or man-engineered. And so he bows before Jesus. Literally, it's, he's at his knees. It's like he's holding him in his knees and saying, depart from me, master, because I'm a sinful man. Implication, and you are not. You are holy. He had done what Jesus wanted, but perhaps not with a full heart of confidence. And yet Jesus, in his graciousness, performed the miracle anyway. (laughs) He does that kind of thing. And Simon's beginning to get it. He's beginning to understand the depth of his need, of the separation that a sinner has from a holy God, the inconsistency of his faith. And at the same time, he's beginning to get the fact that this Jesus may well be the promised Messiah. Verse 9 recaps the response of Simon and all his companions. It's amazement. This is not a response to a lucky chance, to beginner's luck. They all knew a miracle when they'd seen it, and they'd seen one. This huge catch of fish amazes James and John and Andrew and Simon. It's going to change them. It is at this moment that Jesus says these interesting words when he says, Do not fear. From now on you will be catching men. You see, when we come face to face with a holy God, even in the case of a miracle that's to our benefit, often our response is fear. Remember how often when the angels showed up in the New Testament, they had to introduce whatever they were saying with, don't be afraid. Do not fear, Jesus says. No, boys, this miracle is not designed to to, to, to drive you away, but to draw you near to me to see how intimate and confident a relationship you can have with me and how much to your benefit to be on the side of God, a God who is going to give his life to pay the penalty of your sin. Realize that you should revere this God. You should understand him as awesome. But he doesn't want to push you away. He wants you to draw near. And in the communion that we celebrated earlier and we'll celebrate in completion in a moment, we see how this is done. How do we come near to God? We come through faith in the cross in what Jesus will do for us. Do not fear. This is a call that he's going to make to discipleship and it begins with do not fear. 
Now, Jesus could say, and he will explain to them as they go on in their mission, it's certainly true that on this mission, you are going to encounter troubles and persecution and struggles of various sorts, including your own failure. But still, you do not need to fear. I will be with you. I will give you power. And when the day comes, I will give you a heavenly reward. Do not fear. So you can put away your nets and boats, for I do have a new job offer for you. From now on, you will, as the original Greek puts it, catch men to life. Isn't that a great description of the Great Commission? You will catch men to life. These four men said yes to the grand adventure that was offered them by Jesus. They brought their boats back to land where they left them. And I mean, literally, they left them as they followed Jesus. Paul Tournier is a guy I read uh, quite a bit. I have several books of his in my library. He's a Christian psychologist from Switzerland who wrote in the 1950s and 1960s. I jotted down a couple of lines uh, from one of his books, uh, The Meaning of Persons, that I feel really fits in with this text. Every adventure requires a decisive act. And every genuine adventure requires risk. Every adventure requires a decisive act, and it involves risk. Jesus called James and John, Andrew and Simon, to an adventure, the greatest adventure possible, one involving a close walk with Almighty God. There was risk. It will certainly be borne out in their life that there was risk, there was a payment, there were sacrifices. But at the end of their life, they would have admitted that it was worth it. Every risk was worth it. But there was the decisive act required for the adventure to begin. They had to say yes to the offer. They had to consider, weigh the evidence, evaluate their options, and then decide that God could be true to his word. As Peter said initially, according to your word, I will do what you want. They could have said no. They could have said, you know, we're content with being part-time disciples. That, that's good enough for us. Or they could answer the call of Jesus and follow wherever he led and that is what they did. And so I ask as we close, what about you? What about the grand adventure that Jesus is asking of you today? Because he is. Does that call to your adventure mean lifestyle changes? Almost certainly. Involvement in the new phase of ministry? letting go of past hurts or grudges, shaking things up in a way that you're able to escape easily begetting sins, turning off the TV, backing away from the computer, giving to a missionary enterprise, getting involved in some of the things that we suggested at the beginning of the service, starting a Bible study, joining a Bible study, stepping up your hospitality. I don't know. That's the good thing for a preacher. He doesn't have to look into your life. He just preaches the text and know that the Holy Spirit will convict and challenge and lead and bless. But I do ask you to consider your adventure. What is Jesus asking of you today? Because this business of discipleship is a full-time thing. And it wasn't, you, you can't just say yes on one day and have it go forever. It doesn't have that kind of momentum. You have to say yes every day. Most of you would admit with me, you have to say yes several times a day. But the God of adventure is always there asking us, come on, put out into the deep water. Answer the call. Become 
a man that will catch other men to life. Will you answer the call? Will you make the decisive act even though it involves risk? My prayer is that you will. We're going to take the second part of our celebration of the Lord's Supper. This is a great time. We'll take a minute to pray on our own about what God might be challenging you to do, what adventure it might be. The adventure may not be some grand thing. There was a point in my life where the adventure meant leaving Denver, Colorado with $12 in my pocket and hitchhiking to a place that I'd never been to. Ended up to be Omaha, Nebraska. You know what? I've had a lot tougher challenges than that since then. And a lot of times they're just adventures that I'm called to by the grace of God to say yes to righteousness and no to my flesh. What adventure is he calling you for today? Let's pray about a minute uh, alone, and then I'll lead you in prayer as we will take the cup, remembering that this adventure is possible because Jesus died for us to make us a royal priesthood, to give us power to live above our flesh, above our fears, to truly be adventurers in his cause. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you once again for going to the cross for us. We didn't deserve it. We were not your friends when you died for us. We were your enemies. We were separated from you and it was our choice. We were busy with hands that suppressed the truth and unrighteousness when you, in your great love and mercy, you shed your blood to pay the penalty of our sin. Lord, what grace, what love, how amazing. Let us now understand, Lord, that that same grace calls us to the adventure of discipleship. There are some things that are going to be common to all believers' lifestyles, but Lord, some things are quite different. The call is very personal, it's very individual. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that we would clearly hear that call this morning and heed that call like Simon and Andrew and James and John did by saying, yes, Lord, according to your word, let it be. We ask that you bless our time as we remember your sacrifice. We pray in your name, amen. Okay, guys, if you'll make the rounds, thank you. If you'd like to stand with us, let's worship.
Before our last song, I have a couple announcements. Um, please get signed up at the information table for pictures next Sunday. Let us know if you have a preference for a 6 o'clock or 6.30 p.m. Christmas Eve service. And please stop by the Adoptive Family Tree to grab a tag for the family we're providing for Christmas. We have more, one more song. For the cleansing power Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless out of white as snow? Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Inside the garments that are stained with sin And be washed in the blood of the Lamb There's a fountain flowing for the soul of me Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb Are you washed in the blood In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb By your garments, by the side of the in the blood of the Lamb Some grand morning when this life is over
guys. <laughs>